Well, good morning. Welcome to Sunday morning worship at South Jefferson Baptist Church. We invite you to come in with and get comfortable in your couch or your chair. Get your copy of God's Word. Open it up. Jacqueline will be leading us in worship. We invite you to sing along with her. Most songs will be sing-along songs, or there will be uh, songs that, that she will lead in worship on, and we'll just sit and listen and meditate upon the words and the truth that she's sharing. But, but we want you to be engaged with what we're doing. Uh, we're excited that you're here with us this morning. We realize you could be anywhere else, but you chose to worship along with us today, and we're grateful for that. We pray for God's blessings upon you. We pray that as you experience worship today, that if, if you don't know Christ as Savior and Lord, that you might give your heart and life to Him. If you are a believer in Lord Jesus Christ, then celebrate today because we are coming into the presence of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. God bless you. Let's join with Jacqueline. She leads us in worship. Good morning, South Jefferson Baptist Church, and welcome to our Sunday morning worship service. Hear the word of the Lord from Psalm 115 as we're called to worship this morning. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory for the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. Why should the nation say, where is their God? Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths, but do not speak, eyes, but do not see. They have ears, but do not hear, noses, but do not smell. They have hands, but do not feel, feet, but do not walk, and they do not make a sound in their throat. Those who make them become like them, so do all who trust in them. O oh, Israel, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. Church, we have gathered together today to worship God through our Lord Jesus Christ and in the power of the Holy Spirit because we serve a God who hears and speaks and works in the world around us. He works in our lives and we know that we have been blessed by Him. We sing today saying, not to us, O oh Lord, but to your name give glory. Amen. Oh, 
Amen. We rejoice together this morning because our Lord Jesus Christ reigns over his creation. The King of Glory entered into our lives to pay the penalty for our sins, and he has triumphed over sin, death, hell, and the grave. We worship him as we rejoice in glorious hope, knowing that the King will return for his church. <coughs> building a kingdom of people that he has ransomed from every tribe and language and people and nation. In all the earth, only our Lord and Savior is worthy of worship and praise. Singing praises to the slaughtered lamb 
Good morning, family. Welcome to Sunday worship at the South Jefferson Baptist Church. I invite you to join me in 1 Samuel chapter 5 at verse 1 this morning. 1 Samuel uh, chapter 5 as we continue on in our a series of sermons through the, the book of 1 Samuel. And uh, it's been good so far. It's going to continue to be good because we're bathing ourselves in the word of God to learn its truths so that we might apply them to our lives. This morning, we're going to look into uh, a story and an account in uh, the book of 1 Samuel that's going to teach us, help us understand that there is no other God before our God, or at least there should not be any God before our God, that we should examine our lives, our, our uh, the way that we uh, worship God and think about God to ensure that in our lives as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, that we keep God the primary focus of our worship and of our thoughts and of our obedience. We saw last week that there was just a, a horrific battle between uh, the Philistines and the Israelites, and uh, there were two battles, and in those two battles, uh, the lives of 34,000 men were lost, among, uh, soldiers, uh, plus two other uh, individuals lost their lives, the sons uh, of Eli, uh, they gave their lives, Hophnis and Phinehas were, were killed in battle. And not only that, but the Ark of God was captured by the Philistines. And after this horrend the horrendous battles between the Israelites and the Philistines, uh, chapter 4 closes with uh, the Ark of the Covenant uh, being carried off into Philistine captivity. It was removed from the battlefield there at Ebenezer, where they had gathered between Ebenezer and Ashdod. It was carried there from the battlefield at Ebenezer to Ashdod, a, a Philistine city. And in that Philistine city was where their primary God was worshiped. And it was moved uh, into the Philistines, the, the temple of, of their God. And it was placed next to the statue of Dagon, who was the primary God that the Philistines worshiped uh, during that day. And the question we want to think about this morning <clears throat> as we come together is whether our God is the one who props us up and holds us up or whether we need to prop up our God uh, because it's not sufficient in itself. Now, what we know and need to understand and remember is that the Lord Almighty, the God, is sovereign. That means that he is greater than anything, greater than any thought, greater than any political system, greater than any power, greater than any resource, greater than any other God, greater than anything created. I mean, great, greater than anything you can see outside your window. God is greater than anything, greater than any circumstance, greater than any trial, greater than any battle greater than any setback, greater than any disappointment. God is greater than anything. He's greater than any political institution. He's greater than any theological thought. He's greater than uh, any scientific thought or mathematical equation. God is greater than anything. Speaking for all who know the living God, the psalmist wrote this in, in three different places. In Psalm chapter 20, verse 7, the psalmist wrote, some trust in chariots and some trust in horses. So things of this earth, things that are manufactured, things that are, are made. He said, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. In Psalm chapter 27, verse 1, we find that the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? And that's a rhetorical question. If God is your light, that means there is no darkness. If you're in need of salvation, then he is your salvation then there is no one to fear. And so then the psalmist says in verse 27, uh, chapter 27, verse 1, the Lord is the, the stronghold of my life, that God holds all about our life together. And so the psalmist asks another rhetorical question in chapter 27, whom shall I be afraid? And the answer is no one. So there's no one to fear. There's no one to be afraid of because God is the our light and our salvation and he's the stronghold of our life and because of that there is absolutely no fear that should overtake the life of a believer in psalm chapter 28 we find that not only is uh, god my light my salvation and my stronghold uh, the psalmist writes in psalm chapter 28 verse 7 the lord is my strength and my shield so he's the one who invigorates you who gives you the ability to withstand uh, the pressures of life, but he's also your shield and your protector. And he goes on to write, because of this, my heart trusts in him and he helps me. My heart leaps for joy and with my song, I praise him. Now, King David wrote these three Psalms, 
Psalm 20, Psalm 27, and Psalm 28. And of course, he's reflecting on his own life and his own experiences. But when we read the writings of, of David, particularly in Psalms, he, we, we come to understand that our God is the upholder of all of our life, the protector of all of our life, the redeemer of all of our life. And it's evident that God supports his people and that God needs nothing from us. And so as we think about this account in 1 Samuel chapter 5, and as we reflect over what uh, David has written in, in the book of Psalms, it becomes evident to us that God is sovereign. However, many uh, professing believers spend lots of time and spend lots of energy propping up their gods, God with a little g. And they have to prop up their God with a little g because they're not supported by the living God, the true God with a capital G. And we're not at all surprised that a non-believer might worship a pagan God. We're not at all surprised that a non-believer might worship a false God. We're born with an innate desire to reach out uh, to the infinite. We're born with an innate desire to reach out to what is holy. We're born with an innate desire to reach out for God. And some misplace uh, that reaching and they reach for a pagan God or a false God. But what about believers? What about when believers uh, point their attraction, point their uh, strength and their devotion to a false God? Is it possible? Does it happen? Perhaps in our own lives that we worship false gods. Now many uh, professing Christians spend their time, uh, spend their worship on something other than Jesus Christ, other than the true and living God. Now the Philistines were Israel's neighbors but they were bad neighbors, but they were still neighbors. And you may have had uh, neighbors that you considered bad neighbors in your life, and they were probably disruptive to your schedule, maybe uh, noisemakers or early risers or, or any number of things that might disrupt the, the normalcy of your life. And the Philistines were, were neighbors, but they were bad neighbors. They were constantly invading and attacking, and the, the, the Philistines lived in what today is known as the Gaza Strip, and uh, you may recognize that name, the Gaza Strip. It's the home of the, the Palestinian Authority today. <clears throat> and those people that are living in the, the Gaza Strip, uh, they're perpetual enemies of Israel uh, today. The Philistines were right on Israel's doorstep uh, back then, just like they are today. And so the Philistines still uh, exist and live in proximity uh, of Israel. Now, you remember from last week that the Israelites uh, superstitiously weaponized the Ark of God so that they might go to battle the Philistines in a war that God never told them to go fight. They just decided to go fight it. But what they were doing was that they, they treated the Ark of the Covenant as though it was a, a talisman, like a, a rabbit's foot or, or like a good luck charm that if they just got the Ark of the Covenant out in front of them, that they would be sure of victory over the Philistines. Now, in truth, if you read the book of Exodus and Deuteronomy, the Ark of the Covenant of God had a particular function. And it, it contained within it, it was a square box, and it came, contained within it uh, specific artifacts that God determined should be in there. But the Ark of the Covenant was really to be a symbol. It was a visual symbol of the presence of an invisible God, but the Ark was not God. Certainly God revealed himself between the cherubim that were on uh, the, the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. He revealed himself as a pillar of fire or uh, by night and a, and a cloud by day as the children of Israel uh, moved through <clears throat> the promised land for those 40 years of, of wandering. But that box was not God. It was just a visible representation of the invisible God. And, and really we, we need to, to step back and take a look at this battle and especially what happened afterward once the Ark of the Covenant was captured by the Philistines. And as we look into this story, it helps us understand how things really could change and would change for the nation of Israel and how they might change in our lives today. Remember, Scripture is given to us so that we can look at it, study it, understand it, and appropriate it to our lives. God does not want us to be surprised when we stand before Him and He tells us that we have either... 
uh, obeyed or disobeyed. He wants us to be fully aware of his expectations about how we should view him and worship him. And so he gives us accounts like this to help us understand what it means to keep God primary and first in our life. So join me in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 5, verse 1, as we read about uh, this account uh, after the ark was captured. We want to learn from this so we might apply some truths to our own life. <clears throat> 1 Samuel chapter 5, verse 1. <clears throat> we read that after the Philistines had captured the ark of God, they took it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. Then they carried the ark into Dagon's temple and set it beside Dagon. So it was beside Dagon, not in front of Dagon, not behind Dagon, but beside Dagon. <clears throat> when the people, this is verse 3, when the people of Ashdod rose early the next day, there was Dagon fallen on his face on the ground, but he was before the ark of God. So somehow Dagon moved from being beside the ark of God to being prostrate, face down, face first, before the ark of God. They took Dagon and put him back in his place. So here was Dagon, their false god, bowing before the ark of the covenant, which was a visual representation of God, but was not God, is not God. God can't be contained in a box. And so they put Dagon back on his pedestal beside the Ark of the Covenant. Verse 4, But the following morning when they arose, there was Dagon fallen on his face on the ground before the Ark of the Lord. So he has gone from being beside the Ark of the Lord to being in front of the Ark of the Lord with his face down, prostrate to the floor. The only problem is, his head and hands had been broken off and were lying in the threshold. Only his body remained lying prostrate before the ark of, the, of God. This is why to this day, neither the priests of Dagon nor any others enter Dagon's temple at Ashdod, uh, <clears throat> step on the threshold. That's because since Dagon's hands and head uh, were uh, laying on the threshold, the threshold now by these pagan priests and pagan people uh, was considered holy. So a lot happening here. And I find it interesting that Dagon's uh, hands and head were broken off and lying on the threshold, but not his feet. Now, it could have been that his feet uh, were not visible in the statue, that he could have been uh, cloaked with a robe. But the things that would allow I mean, people would use to demonstrate power would be hands and head was removed. Now, when the, when the Philistines captured the ark, uh, they didn't destroy it as one might expect. I mean, they knew that, well, if you read in chapter 4, they thought that the, the Ark of the Covenant was uh, a god and that Israel had many gods. Uh, the word gods in chapter 4 is in the plural. But you would expect that they might um, destroy the Ark of the Covenant because in, in the Philistines' mind, this was a god. I mean, how often do you get a chance to kill a god? And, and, and we might think that, that the Philistines would have destroyed the Ark of the Covenant in an effort to kill uh, Israel's God. But instead, they kept what they believed to be Israel's God as a trophy. I mean, after all, they had heard about the great success that the Ark of the Covenant had brought Israel in the past, and it was a misplaced understanding. It was not the Ark of the Covenant uh, that had brought great success to the nation of Israel. It was God who brought great success to the nation of Israel. But both the Israelites and the Philistines missed out on that fact. They thought it was the box and not Almighty God. And, 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 and the Philistines may have thinking that there, there might come a time when they might need this God in a box to help them out. So they put the ark in the temple of their own God, Dagon. I mean, they, they could have been thinking that they were paying the God of Israel some sort of compliment. They could have been thinking here, we're bringing Dagon this reward of another God that now Dagon, you are greater than this God of Israel. But they were also probably thinking that they were installing another God alongside the ones that they already had there in Ashdod. In their minds, it really couldn't be any better because now they had their God, Dagon, 
and they had the God of Israel. And their enemy Israel was defeated and they had captured its God in that box, so they thought. And for them, life was good. And it was because of their God, Dagon, that Dagon had given them a victory over the, Philist the, the Israelites. But in the next morning, when they entered into Dagon's temple, the statue of Dagon had fallen prostrate before the Ark of God. He wasn't face up, he was face down, as in paying homage. And for uh, the priests and the people of Ashdod, I mean, this could never be. We could never have our God bowing before uh, the dogs of Israel, their God. And so they had to remedy that right away. So they put Dagon back up on his pedestal and went about their day as if nothing happened. Nothing changed. Dagon's back in his place. The next day, they find Dagon had not just fallen off his pedestal and again lying prostrate before the ark of God, but now his head and hands were broken off. In other words, there was nothing left of their God but a stump of its former self. Now this is important. I asked the question earlier, is it possible that we might have gods before God? If we do, God will deal with those gods in our life so that there's nothing but a stump of it left. Now, in part, this story shows us how spiritually declined people can become. It's the kind of the God in the box theology. For the Philistines, the God was the box. For the nation of Israel, the God was the box. And so they were going to weaponize the box. And unfortunately, it's the theology of a lot of people today. We want to put God in a box and, and express what God can do, what God cannot do, when God's available, what he should have control of in our lives. If we're not careful, we'll embrace the idols that this world offers while also trying to maintain worship of the living God. And that's what we see the Philistines doing. They were trying to worship their God, but also extend some form of worship to the, the Ark of the Covenant, which they thought was God. Now, uh, mo modern day Philistines can represent the world today. So can I say the world? The, the world is trying to convince us to, to use God really much in the same way as the Israelites and the Philistines did in these ancient days. And it's as if we're trying to place the Christian God in many times alongside our own gods in, in our lives. <clears throat> And this requires careful and examination and personal transparency. And if there's ever a time when we, we need a God, then we, we think we'll pull him down off the shelf and employ his services and then uh, put him back where he was when, when the need is met. And this is exactly what the world is doing with God today. Even the world no longer believes in the God of the Bible. But they're still not altogether finished with it. We, we, Political ads are filling our airways now, and many politicians are evoking the name of God or quoting scripture. And, and this world makes use of God when it fits their needs. The world around us is paying lip service to the Lord, and yet they only want him for their purposes, just like the Philistines in 1 Samuel chapter 5. And this attitude exposes the reality that we're not interested in God as a person, in God as a savior. And many times, all we're interested in is what he can do for us, that he can keep us out of hell or, or give us fire insurance. And many don't desire to know him personally and to commune with God personally on a daily basis. But many do desire his help in times of need, like in our present pandemic with this coronavirus. We've got to understand, though, that, that God is active, that God is alive, and he cannot be put into some box and forgotten and then pulled out whenever there is a need. Only false gods can be placed into a box. The true sovereign and the living God is not boxable. We can't put him in a box. We cannot confine him. That's what makes him sovereign. And it was the mistake that Israel made. And by what happened afterward, it's also the mistake that the Philistines made. And God is teaching us here, at least in part, that he is the almighty, eternal, all-powerful God in whose hands our lives are held, all of our lives from beginning to end. See, God is not defeated. He cannot be defeated and he cannot be held captive by anything or anyone, not even another little G God. Instead, we see God in 1 Samuel 5 pronouncing judgment 
and knocks down all of the false gods that we might have in our lives. The gods that we've set up in his place or have set alongside of him, they've all been judged. And in truth, he is the Lord who is without limit and without equal, for there is only one God. In the very first commandment that we uh, have in Scripture, God said, you shall have no other gods before me in Exodus chapter 23. He's saying that there is no other God that could ever stand in any way, occupy time or space before him. And then through the prophet Isaiah, the Lord said in Samuel chapter 40, in, or in Isaiah chapter 43, verse 10, God says, before me, no God was formed, nor will there be one after me. God unequivocally claiming that he is the only God. And in Isaiah 45, verse 5, the Lord said, I am the Lord, and there is no other. Apart from me, there is no God. Now, the Philistines thought that they were paying God a compliment, most likely, by placing him alongside Dagon. Yet, it was in Dagon's own temple, where his people had come to worship him, that God demonstrated that there can be but one God. And God did it twice, and he did it decisively. If we put uh, God beside any other little G God, then the Lord will silence those little gods in our lives. He will take them down to a stump of their former self. Because anything we place beside or in front of the Lord, uh, our God, it will come tumbling down. And the message today is that God is not defeated. He's still on the throne and he will destroy every enemy and every false idol that we attempt to place before him. If we would hope to be blessed by God, then we need to learn this lesson that we can no, no longer rely upon ourselves, upon our knowledge, upon our understanding, upon our institutions, upon our political system, upon our theologies. We must only rely upon God. We need to go to God completely helpless and receive strength and fullness from the Holy Spirit that comes through us by faith in Jesus Christ, the Savior and Lord. And it's only then that we can meet and defeat the challenges that present themselves in our daily lives. Now, we're quite vocal as evangelicals, as Baptists, that our God is the living God. We don't say we have idols. We just don't ever claim them. But are we certain that we don't have idols? Are you certain that you don't have idols? Is it possible that I might have an idol? Is it possible that you might have an idol? Now, I'm not suggesting that you have the, that you've taken a, a knife and you've carved out an image of wood and placed it in your home. If you're, very few of us will ever craft an idol like that uh, to which we might bow. And I'm not in any way suggesting that you have created an idol God that you've placed in your house. But I am suggesting that if we're not careful, we may have indeed begun to worship idols in our lives. An idol is anything that displaces our love, our obedience, our loyalty for the one living God. Now, if you or I have an idol, we will have learned one thing, that that idol in our life needs our defense, that idol in our life needs our protection, that idol in our life needs our propping up because that idol is not a true God. We have to prop up our God rather than having our God, the true living God, prop us up. Now, maybe we need to take a little more time to think this through. Now, the Philistines were idolaters. They worshiped false gods. They were pagans. But Israel, God's own children, if you look in the account carefully, they were guilty of idolatry as well. They were worshiping that box. They considered that box to be God. But that box was never God. It was just a symbol of the invisible God. The Philistines at least recognized the might of the living God. In chapter 4, they were afraid when they heard the big shouts because they knew and had heard the stories uh, of what God had done for the nation of Israel uh, when they were drawn out of Egypt. And they were aware of all how the ways that God delivered Egypt and the plagues and and had known that story, that account, for more than 500 years. 
But in truth, Baptists are guilty of making family their idol. Sometimes we're guilty of making our employer our idol, or our home, or our possessions. Sometimes we esteem family as more important than God. We would rather hear a, hear a spouse complain or have a child pitch a fit instead of having them attend a worship service with us. We would rather stay home on a Sunday morning uh, time of worship than to listen to our spouses and children complain. We would rather find time to go sledding in the winter, fishing in the summer, or hunting in the fall, or golfing when the weather is nice. I mean, you know, we work hard during the day. We have to have some time for ourselves. And our weekends are precious. And going to church is so demanding. How often do those things creep before the worship of the true and living God? People embrace these things and make these excuses prop, uh, prop up their God rather than their God propping them up. Now there's something strange that leaps out uh, from this story that perhaps you caught. The Philistines had witnessed the power of the living God. They had heard about the power of the living God. And they convinced themselves that they had demonstrated that Dagon was superior to to the God of Israel, that Dagon was the more superior God. However, Dagon was defeated and utterly humiliated in his own temple. Now, wouldn't you think after witnessing, I mean, remember, you, you thought Dagon was the more superior God because you now had the Ark of the Covenant. But he was cast down, cast down a second time with his head and hands broken off. Wouldn't you think that if you had witnessed such a thing as that, your God being uh, fallen prostrate uh, before the ark of God and having his hands and head removed, wouldn't you think that something like that would have made you think that perhaps Dagon was not the superior God? Wouldn't you have thought after witnessing that that you might have a different opinion about the God of the nation of Israel? However, that's not what the Philistines did. They found Dagon's head and hands both lying on the threshold. I mean, they would have trampled uh, under been trampled underfoot by those who entered uh, his temple. It lets us know that Dagon is powerless. Our idols are powerless. And all they can see is that the threshold now is somehow holy because his hand and his or his hands and his head are lying at the threshold. What we have here is an adventure in missing the point. And it's an important point. Folks, there is no God before God. Jesus, our Lord, our God, our Savior, is either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. But praise God that Jesus, the Son of God, broke the bonds of death. And because of that, and because we have a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, we must not allow anything to come between us and God. We should not allow anything, must not allow anything to become before our God, before our Lord and our Savior. This account is so important. Remember, God gives us these accounts in Scripture to teach us, to help us understand about his expectations of his children and what we can expect from him. And this passage helps us understand that if we intend to embrace any idol God, God will silence and humiliate that idol God. The only safe place, secure place to be, and we read it in those three chapters from Psalms, is to place our faith, our security in the Lord our God and in him alone. I pray this morning as we've gathered around this passage of scripture from 1 Samuel chapter 5, that you have been willing to be transparent and vulnerable with yourself and to evaluate yourself and to ask yourself, have I placed foreign gods, false gods, anything between myself and the true and living God? If you have, I invite you to repent of that sin. I invite you to, to take measures and take steps to correct that, that, that error that you place God first and primary in your life above all things and above everything else. 
God bless you this morning. I know that you want to serve God faithfully. I know you want to commit your way to God, and I pray that you would. I'm grateful for pastors like this that help us understand that no one and nothing could ever come before our true and living God. Let's bow in prayer. Father, I thank you for stories like this and accounts like this that help us understand that we must keep you primary and in first place in our lives and that there is no foreign God, no pagan God, no false God that could ever challenge the true and living God in any kind of successful way. I thank you, God, that this lesson teaches us that you're not in a box, but that you're sovereign God, ruler and reigner over all that is. Father, I thank you that as we read these accounts, that we know that we are safe and secure because we serve and worship the true and living God. It's in Jesus' name I pray. God bless you. South Jefferson, my prayer for us today is that God has used our time together to break the hands and faces of the idols in our lives and that Jesus has shown us how superior he is to anything that we would put in place above him. Will you respond to him today as the Holy Spirit leads?
opportunity it's been today to worship together with you, church. As we depart today, I just pray the blessings of God upon you, and may you depart in the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, what a blessing it is to worship our Lord and Savior together. Thank you for joining us today. We gather together for worship every Sunday. At about the same time, the videos are published around 1030 on Sunday. And we get together Wednesday around 630. We invite you to join us at those times. We want you to experience the power of God's presence in your life. Our deep desire is that we worship in spirit and in truth. Thank you for worshiping with us today. Thank you for singing. Thank you for listening. Thank you for praying. God bless you.